for coming and wake, uh, thank you for waking up. Um, uh, so the theme today is chance and uh, for me um, chance actually embrace a lot of um, interpretations. Um, uh, as a designer or as an architect uh, chance, chances is kind of key uh, to whatever that we do because without you know trust from clients chances to design we won't be designing. So I guess every part of my career um, is about chance. Um, and more importantly, it's about taking chances with design. Um, I was born in Hong Kong and I actually left for education in the UK when I was 14. I was there for about 14 years and then I came back to Hong Kong um, properly in 2004. So I've been in practice with my studio for about 10 years um, in Hong Kong. And uh, we have grown from a, a studio of one, which is literally myself, um, to a studio of 20 people. So um, there has been a lot of trust uh, from wonderful clients to give me the opportunity to do what I enjoy doing and, um, and, and kind of continuing uh, to, to do at the moment. So today I've just kind of picked nine projects um, that uh, I have, I kind of enjoy. And I think in, in, a, in a lot of respect, they actually embrace the, the spirit of chance. Uh, I'll go through them one by one, uh, quite casually, just to, to share with you um, the kind of stories behind them. Uh, the first one is, is, um, is uh, the Oprah Suite at the Barclay Hotel in London. Um, Barclay is one of the more iconic, uh, one of the most iconic hotels in London, um, very much an establishment in its own right. The owner um, is called Maybourne Hotels. They own three hotels. They own the Claridge's, they own the Cornort, and they own the Barclay. And as a child growing up in London, um, you know, being at a bus driving past Knightsbridge, seeing the Barclay, is it's, it's always been something that's in my memory. And actually, funny enough, about three years ago, I was at my office and someone rang the bell and I opened the door, I was on the way to the bathroom and then this guy said, I'm the owner of the Barclay. Um, is Andre Fu here? And, um, and it, it sounds like a, a completely ridiculous story, but that's actually the truth. And I actually started to talk to him and start to um, have this conversation. And he mentioned that with his group, they've done you know, big suites with Diane from Furstenberg, David Collins, and he asked if I would be interested to do one of the bigger suites um, within the Maybourne group. So I was entrusted with this opportunity, uh, this rare chance uh, to do a, a suite that is about um, 2,800 square foot. Um, so we knocked down uh, five guest rooms and a suite at the Barclay and converted it into a singular suite with two bedrooms. So um, within the suite, we have basically um, done all bespoke furnishings, lighting, um, a lot of bamboo finishes uh, with English oak uh, flooring, and then also um, carpets that we did with Taiping carpets. So it's very much um, the spirit of innovation. Um, the Barclay, it's all about bespoke innovation. So we actually took that to another level by bringing modern simplicity and very tactile elements uh, into the scheme. Uh, this is the bathroom. This is one of the most iconic moments uh, inside the suite uh, where we have created two kind of, I call them stone pillows uh, that actually embrace the clients as they are bathing. Um, another project is the Clifford Pier in Singapore. It's actually the entrance uh, of the Fullerton Bay Hotel. Um, the chance to work within Southeast Asia, I guess, is something that I do quite regularly now. Uh, but Clifford Pier has been something that has quite an important role in my career. 
The reason being that uh, when we did the Fullerton Bay Hotel, the actual pier, which is the entrance of the hotel, was actually leased out to a restaurant tenant. And the whole experience of the Fullerton Bay was fairly disjointed at the time. And last year, we were given the chance to redo it um, in the context of the hotel. So um, the equivalent of Clifford Pier for Hong Kong is the Queen's Pier. So it's got a strong kind of historical uh, background to it because it's very much the pier that all migrants uh, back in the 1930s uh, first landed in Singapore. That's the place where they land. Um, we had a lot of uh, regulations that we have to deal with uh, because the whole structure is protected. It's a conserved uh, building. And we have to work with URA, which is the local uh, kind of heritage preservation company uh, authority, uh, to deal with a lot of uh, rules. We were evening, even kind of uh, have debates about the heights of the armchairs because the authority doesn't want um, anything to block the architecture, despite the fact that it's 11 meters high. <laughs> um, so this is what we've come up with, um, a space that's very, very symmetrical, uh, strong sense of balance. Uh, we've clipped these um, custom-made lights into the ceiling, um, a kind of modern interpretation of the colonial spirit. Um, and. Uh, generally a lot of uh, decorative pendants just to embellish the space with a sense of warmth. Um, and also we have uh, a kind of outdoor terrace where guests can enjoy the view of the Marina Bay, looking over at the Esplanade. Um, again, in my view, casual, chic, but in a colonial manner. Another project that we did in London uh, Again, uh, a crazy opportunity is uh, the project that we did at the top of the Shard. Uh, for those of you, of you that knows London, um, the Shard is a very unique uh, building because you don't get skyscrapers in London to start off with, and to do it at the top of the building was very challenging. Um, the Shard actually starts off with quite a big footprint, and then it actually kind of tapers up. So when you're up at the top, actually the footprint is tiny um, and the lift court is gigantic. So, so with a very tiny footprint around the whole building and um, people just see the shot as a building with four sides, but actually it has 18 sides. So it's really faceted and very complicated structure. So what we did was we kind of cut it into a series of salons or chambers as we call it. And we came up with the uh, spirit of, uh, or inspiration of Gong, uh, which is basically the Chinese architectural motif of uh, Dao Gong, which is the thing that actually supports a lot of temple structure. And we see a kind of interesting um, synergy between that and the spirit of the Shard being the tallest building in, um, in Europe. Um, within the, the, uh, the bar itself, uh, we've kept it very modern, uh, but at the same time, probably the most oriental inspired project that I've done. So we've done a lot of cinnabar, uh, kind of red lacquered panels, and we juxtapose it with really tactile, uh, really textured um, English ash, uh, which is bleached and um, has a very strong texture to it. Uh, little elements uh, with the bar, we have a, a kind of daogong uh, right below the shelf uh, just to embrace the spirit. And um, continuing with my story with Shang uh, Grilla, which is a client that has worked uh, quite closely with me during my career, um, is their project in Istanbul. Um, working in Istanbul is very challenging because it's definitely um, if you say Hong Kong is a mixture of the East and the West, um, Istanbul is kind of the extreme end of it. Um, and for this particular restaurant, we want to um, do something that is, has the spirit of Istanbul in my interpretation. So I looked at um, the Blue Mosque um, in, in, in Istanbul, 
And what's amazing is this kind of halo of light that was floating in the, in the mosque itself. So we are trying to reinterpret that in a fairly kind of modern manner. This is the reception of the restaurant where we have created a, a, a special marble mosaic, uh, something that's very Turkish, uh, but we've used turquoise blue and orange um, as, as a kind of uh, celebration of the kind of Istanbul um, colors. We have created a wine cellar at the entrance uh, with rose gold metal uh, just to frame the sense of arrival. And then when you get to the main restaurant, uh, this is the halo of light that we have created in the ceiling. So it's about 160 um, uh, light fixtures uh, that's floating in the entire ceiling. Again, a way to kind of celebrate uh, the, what, how I interpret um, the Blue Mosque um, in a modern context. Um, and this continues to other parts of the restaurant facing out to the Bosphorus, uh, again with a very dramatic uh, long pendant uh, in the ceiling. Back to chance again, um, the Fullerton Bay Hotel, uh, which is part of the Clifford Pier, or Clifford Pier being a part of the Fullerton Bay Hotel. Um, Again, opportunity is very rare uh, to work in a historical building, uh, let alone um, a waterfront iconic pier uh, that's linked uh, to the hotel itself. And I enjoy projects of this scale. Um, it's very intimate. It's just 108 rooms. Um, long, long, long public space. It's like a very linear uh, uh, kind of uh, sense of arrival. Usually in hotels, you go in the entrance and then you turn right is the restaurant, you turn left is the ballroom and so on and so forth. But with this particular project, because you go into the pier and you have to go sideways into the hotel. Um, and there are basically rooms of really different proportions. It starts from the really huge pier to a really long and kind of low kind of passageway and then you lead onto the main lobby, which has six story high double height. So what we did was um, to juxtapose the very modern architecture, because other than the pier itself, the rest um, of the space is actually brand new. It's like a glass box. But what I wanted to do is to bring in uh, something that actually celebrates um, the kind of colonial heritage uh, spirit of Singapore. So this is the bit as you go in. Um, via the pier, um, this is where you reach to. Uh, where, again, we want to embrace the Singapore culture, uh, a little bit of the Islamic pattern uh, on the special marble mosaic floor, uh, leading down into a glass box with alfresco dining, and then the 18-meter high um, main lobby um, with a very kind of symmetrical backdrop, and then the bistro, um, Clifford, which again has very, very long space, very, very high ceiling. So in order to make it intimate and warm, we have divided it into a series of salons just to keep it uh, much more of a person, kind of things on a much more kind of personal scale. And then the pinnacle of the experience is the top of the hotel where we have the lantern, the rooftop bar with amazing views of the, um, of the bay itself. Um, another project, the Shoe Library uh, for Lynn Crawford on Canton Road. Uh, as a designer, to do a retail store in Hong Kong or Asia is actually quite rare because normally it's, it's a design, especially for an established brand. It's usually a design that is, is prefabricated and then you kind of replicate it in Asia. Uh, to do a multi-brand, is even more challenging because you have to remember that there is the visual merchandising part that constantly evolve. Um, for this particular opportunity, we are given the opportunity to work on probably the largest or one of the largest shoe space in Asia. It's 25,000 square foot. 
um, of retail space um, dedicated to shoe retail alone. So what we've done is, I'm not a fashionista, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was bombarded with the whole Lane Crawford team about all the brands, Alaya, <laughs> Givenchy, and all that. So the first thing we came up with is the concept of a shoe library. So this is how we've interpreted the library. Uh, we've built really tall shelves, and we have actually created uh, VMs uh, on the wall, which is basically bookends uh, at the end of the book, and we kind of push them together, and we print the actual um, uh, visual for each season. So actually, they evolve. So the whole experience is divided into kind of, again, layers, which is something that is quite strong in my work. Uh, this is the first room. Uh, we call it, again, the library. Um, because we have eight hero brands like Longvan or McQueen um, that actually frames this first kind of experience. Another view of that. And then it actually goes into two salons uh, where we have two uh, iconic shoe brands. So it's Jimmy Choo and Christian Louboutin uh, for these two areas. And we actually, actually met Christian and we actually talked about it because typically he needs his space in red and he actually allowed me to do what I, want, I wanted to do. <laughs> uh, and then we have a marketplace and then we also have Blitz, which is for all the crossovers that they have. Um, as an architect, I also love doing art spaces. And one of the, the, chance, the chance, again, that I was given with is to do Gallery Paraton um, at uh, 50 Cornot Road in Hong Kong. And Emmanuel is definitely quite a character. Uh, dealing with gallerists is not easy. Um, and this particular project uh, is very challenging because we have a footprint of 7,000 square foot. And if you're given the chance to do a, a gallery that is 7,000 square foot, um, you have to pretty much maximize it as much as possible because you're paying Hong Kong rent. Um, but the real challenge is we are not allowed to block any of the windows. So typically in galleries, you want to pretty much close, you know, put as much wall as possible just to close it off. So what we did was we actually divided the footprint up into five rooms, and we actually flip the circulation of the gallery out to the window side. So when you enter the gallery, you enter into one big space, and then you're pushed out to go along the window, and then actually feeds back into the remaining salons. So this is one of the salons that we have. Uh, again, rooms of different proportions, some wider, some taller. Um, something that will actually fundamentally hope to kind of inspire the artist. So this is the circulation that I was talking about. It actually connects um, the full stretch of the, um, of the, of the, uh, the gallery. A quick one, um, IFC residents in Shanghai, um, the opportunity to do a very modern and luxurious uh, service residence um, in Shanghai. The concept of a mansion, um, huge spaces in the public space, uh, in the lobby, uh, very much embracing a kind of living room spirit. Reaching up to the top is the swimming pool alongside a kind of very s kind of small outdoor lounge space, a sunken garden as I call it. Last but not least, uh, the upper house, which is pretty much the project that gave, gave me my career. Um, some people thought that uh, I've known Swive or Swire properties for a long time, but actually I didn't know them at all um, when, uh, when I was, uh, actually I met them probably back in 2006, um, two years after I came back to Hong Kong. And funny enough, I was out of pure chance. Um, uh, I was doing some private residentials at the time, and the piece was actually uh, published at, in Post Magazine. And the chairman of Swire actually picked up the story and he asked his head of projects to kind of see me. So, you know, then I told him I am a company of three. Uh, <laughs> I have no insurance. I don't know what uh, specification for to do a kind of hotel is like. Um, they have interviewed probably about 50 designers from some of the really iconic people to kind of young chaps like myself. Um, 
And within two weeks, I was signed up to do the hotel. The upper house was a very challenging project, um, partly because I had no experience of doing a hotel. But what was really um, unbelievable was the trust that I was given um, um, to kind of do this very interesting project. Um, the hotel was actually designed with the chairman of Swire Hotels. At the time, the hotel operation was not even formulated. So I was actually designing with the chairman, the finance director. There were about 12 <laughs> very serious English guys that I was dealing with. Um, um, what we have created is uh, ultimately a place that is about small places. Um, it's very much the antithesis of a big hotel. Um, for example, we've created a lawn um, um, in the kind of transient floor of the hotel. Uh, and I've dedicated a huge space to the steps, very much in celebration of the journey, as I was talking about. Um, the room matrix was quite unusual as well, in the sense that we have given huge space to each room um, by reducing as much of the public footprint as possible. So each room, the smallest room is uh, it's about 70, uh, 68 square meters. 680 square foot, which is pretty much double the size of a typical hotel room. Uh, as you all know, uh, we had uh, the Merritt Hotel right below the upper house. It's a 24-hour hotel. Well, a hotel at Merritt is obviously um, in operation when we did the hotel. But in order to do the bathroom uh, against the window, we have to reconfigure all the vertical pipe ducts in the entire hotel. So with all the drilling and structural alterations that we did, um, it was, again, done with huge uh, level of trust and confidence um, from the developer. At the top of the hotel um, is uh, an umbrella feature, as I call it, because for me, um, in Asian culture, uh, an umbrella uh, is something that shelters you or protects you very much in keeping with the spirit of the house. Um, a very informal lounge with a fireplace, uh, which was a big debate. Would Hong Kong, you know, typically where at like 30 degrees, would a fireplace work? But now that the fireplace is there, we never look back. And it's probably one of the, big, uh, the best thing that I've done in the whole hotel. Um, the uh, Cafe Grey. Again, a very challenging restaurant uh, to build. Um, this was, is on level 49. The hotel actually has, had, well, the building itself, when we, I was inherited uh, the project, it had a level 50. And we convinced the client uh, to gut out one entire floor um, to create a higher ceiling. And we actually removed all the glass on this particular floor uh, from uh, full, fully reflective glass into clear glass. Because otherwise, at night, it will just reflect everything in the room. So by making it into clear glass, you get a view out. Uh, lastly, uh, a more recent project that I did for Louis Vuitton. Um, it's a pop-up space um, that has a lifespan of six weeks. And uh, we took uh, pop-up probably to the extreme end uh, by creating an interior that uh, is, actually, it's in um, Central. It's right above Yonki. It's in, uh, it's in uh, a private club called Key. Um, it was a very dark, colorful space. It was burgundy and black and bright green. And we asked Vuitton, we came up with this scheme of l'appartement. Um, it's, it's a place where they invite uh, their friends of the house uh, or their house um, to come and enjoy um, for lunch or dinner or breakfast or afternoon tea. Um, very residential. It's basically a residential apartment uh, that, is, uh, that kind of embodies the spirit of a modern Hong, Hong Kong uh, jet setter. So we have created artwork. Uh, we did probably 60 pieces of bespoke furnishing, uh, custom-made carpets, 
lighting. Uh, we have ripped out all the speakers in the ceiling. We have reconfigured all the smoke detectors, sprinklers. We have to shut down the whole fire alarm system of Yonki for six <laughs> hours just to get to this pure effect. Uh, within the dining space, we've even installed a temporary uh, four ceiling uh, with uh, these light bulb installation. Um, again, something that embraced the kind of monogram of Vuitton. And also a boudoir where they showcase um, the first fashion collection of Nicolas Jasquier. So that wraps up my in quick introduction to some of my works and also about um, how I see the, the, um, what's critical to my opportunity, the chance, um, the chances to design and also to take chances with design. Thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, Actually, more and more uh, with a lot of my clients, they kind of know my, my work these days. So they, they kind of trust me, they give me carte blanche. And it seems like everybody thinks that I have clients that give me unlimited budget to do whatever I want. <laughs> uh, but that's not true. Uh, currently, we are working quite extensively around Asia. And some of the clients have quite fairly different uh, uh, aesthetics. Uh, or perception of aesthetics to, to typically what I believe in. Um, I guess the key is really to persuade them in a manner that they actually feel that you're designing for them and you're not designing for yourself. Um, if you try to submerge yourself, yourself in their perspective and try to understand them as much as possible, um, if you can actually show that level of passion and, uh, and understanding and a willingness to, to try, I guess that's probably the, the most important thing. And I think that kind of energy uh, will self-perpetuate itself into something that will have a positive um, uh, effect. Yeah. I haven't really thought about it. I guess when I first, when I was a child, I had, a, I had this funny aspiration of designing a hotel uh, when I turned 30. Um, and, and funny enough, I was awarded the Upper House uh, project just, just after I turned 30. Um, I guess now, uh, Actually, a lot of things exceed my expectation, and there's a lot of expectations from people that I work with or work for these days. So it's more about just embracing the opportunity and try to give it my best shot. It's, it's actually not easy uh, because I'd like to, I don't run my studio on a, on a project division kind of basis. So I'm still very much involved in every project. Um, so it's a bit schizophrenic because <laughs> It, it ranges from, uh, for example, we're working with, um, we're working on a Park Hyatt resort in Korea, uh, in Seoul. Uh, I guess that's quite similar. But there are really urban scenarios that's very like uh, resorty type of scenario too. So I just have to keep my mind quite clear and try to keep them as original as possible. Uh, but it's a long. For those of you in design, especially in hospitality design, um, each project takes forever. It could be four to five years. So when I, when I talk to younger students, I, I keep telling them, it's, it's, I keep saying that it's sort of imagine yourself dating someone for four years. <laughs> but it's not dating one person. You're dating like 15 people <laughs> at the same time and you have to give them all personal attention. <laughs> and you can't tell them what the other person is about. So, <laughs> so, 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 um, yeah, I guess that, that, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I guess as a, as, 
as someone that was trained in architecture, as all architect students, you love the kind of minimalist, uh, very kind of contemporary, pure lines, um, you know, Mies, Corbusier, um, that, that type of uh, Peter Zomta, that kind of architecture. Um, I guess that's how I started off with. And throughout my career, I'm able to, uh, I hope I still respect that, uh, those integrity. Um, but then again, I love the fact that I can be, I, I, I mean, it sounds very cheesy, but I don't want to be a designer that's, uh, that's categorized by a style. And I also want to do design that has a timeless quality. Um, in the interior field these days, there is a growing tendency to do projects that are picture savvy, um, and I call them social media friendly. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, there are even designers that talk extensively, you know, about creating space that, that looks like a, you know, a, a set or, or, or something that's more on a, on a pop-up nature. Oh, you know, like the apartment, but uh, how I see it is it's, it's, it's a big commitment. You know, to do, to do a hotel, for example, it's, it's at least five to six years of commitment. And, and for the, those six years, you really have to kind of hold tight because you're working with so many people. Like, typically, there's like 20 consultants on board, and each of them, you know, people change, come and go. Um, and you have to drive that vision all the way from the beginning to the end and even down the line when it's in operation Like I still ring up the upper house if I you know if I think the flowers are not quite right <laughs> <laughs> so 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 uh, So back to your question uh, Hopefully yeah something that is timeless, but at the same time uh, something that will embrace the culture of wherever that we're working in and more importantly, to deliver the vision of the client because I'm not designing for myself.